Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Hans and Gülchin for the invitation here. As a few years ago, Anthony Müller aptly said, this conference is the Wimbledon of the Libertarians, so I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'll be talking about Italy today, about uh, Italian history, and the, the theme of my speech is state-making as war-making, so the deep connection between state and war. And I will start with, um, with um, five quotes from different writers and thinkers and so on, which can be a good introduction for Italy as, as a theme. The first one is from Francesco Petrarca. We heard about Dante. Petrarca is another uh, outstanding medi medieval writer. And this is a piece from uh, uh, poetry of Petrarca dedicated to Italy. Uh, quote, Valor will take up arms against wild attacks, and the battle will be short, for ancient valor is still strong in Italian hearts. This was deeply inspiring for uh, Italian patriots. The second one is from the prince of Machiavelli. You know Machiavelli had two versions. The one um, Tim referred to yesterday the, in his commentaries to Livy, and where he advocates for um, virtue and, um, and um, ethical values. And then you have the prince, where he advocates for a ruthless um, ruler. And this is from Machiavelli, quote, Italy, half dead, is still waiting for someone to heal its wounds and put an end to the ravaging of Lombardy and to the extortionate taxing of the kingdom of Naples and of Tuscany, cleansing the sores that have festered for so long. It's clear that Italy is begging God to send someone who will deliver it from its cruel ill treatment at the hands of the foreigners. It's also clear that Italy is ready and willing to march behind a flag if only someone will raise one." Unquote. The third is the most interesting quote, and it comes from uh, Fedor Dostoevsky, the Russian writer. In his um, the book, it's okay, it's not a book, it's from his diary of a writer. Quote, take the instance of Count Cavour. Cavour was the, the prime minister who unified Italy, just so, as a footnote. Wasn't his a great mind? Wasn't he a diplomat? I am citing him because his genius is generally recognized and also because he is dead. Yet, what did he do? Look, oh, he did achieve his aim. He did unite Italy. But what was the result? For 2,000 years, Italy bore in herself a universal unifying idea, not some abstract idea, not a speculation of some theoretical mind, but a realistic, organic idea, the fruit of the national and universal life. This was the unification of the whole world. First, the ancient Roman and later the papal unification. The peoples who have been growing and disappearing in Italy in the course of these two and one half millennia understood that they were the bearers of a universal idea, while those who did not understand it felt and divined it. Science, art, everything was invested and permeated with this universal significance. Oh, let us admit that at length this universal idea became worn out and wasted there, although hardly so. But what in the long run has come in its stead? Upon what can Italy be congratulated? What advantage has she achieved after Count Cavour's diplomacy? There arose a second-rate little kingdom which has lost every kind of universal aspiration, which exchanged it for the most worn-out bourgeois principle, the 30th repetition of this principle since the French Revolution, a kingdom fully content with its unity, which means nothing, a mechanical, not a spiritual unity, it has not the former universal unity, and on top of that, a kingdom burdened with insolvent indebtedness, and in addition, one specifically content with its own second-ratedness. 
This is what came of it. Such was Count Cavour's creation." Unquote. And then the last two quotes. Uh, this is from Prince Metternich, the Austrian general. It's very short. Quote, Italy is a geographical expression, unquote. And the last is from an Italian singer, Giorgio Gaber, who had very deep insights about the Italian character. And uh, the quote is this. I have it from memory. Maybe I, I be, I'll be a little bit wrong. Um, I'm not proud of being Italian, but luckily or unluckily, I am one. <clears throat> so with these quotations in mind, we'll start um, my reflections about war and state-making with the case of Italy. Um, Italy as a place is the birthplace of militarism. Uh, mil the militarism we have nowadays with its symbols, acronyms, uh, medals, eagles, and so on, was invented by the ancient Romans. And uh, militarism is still the Roman tradition. It changed during the centuries and millennia, but it's still the same tradition. Um, it is the tradition of what the ancient Romans called imperium. Imperium is the right of the military ruler. It is an absolute right. It is the right to decide about life and death of the subjects. It is the right of conquest. And um, you cannot but think of uh, Oppenheimer, who was um, quoted yesterday as well. As you know, Oppenheimer distinguished between two systems of uh, social life what he called the economic means, which is producing and exchanging goods on a voluntary basis, on the basis of contracts, and the political means. The political means is forced appropriation of other people's goods by uh, violence or fraud. And uh, the Roman Empire is the big example of um, the political means made as a system. Uh, Rome lived on the exploitation of other countries, uh, of wars on con of conquest for a long time, and once it became impossible to conquer other people, they had to start a war against their own citizens. Um, the works of uh, Rostovtsev are probably the best ones in describing the, the fiscal collapse of the Roman Empire. And um, my personal interpretation is that um, this is the time when Italians were born. So until Italians were ancient Romans, they belonged to this great military, republican, and later imperial enterprise of uh, conquering other people and, um, and making, uh, and, and grabbing their, their wealth. Uh, the, um, the phrase from Virgil, uh, tu Romane populos imperio uh, dominare memento, is the, the, the idea. So the imperium, the military might, is the way to be the rulers of the world. Once this ended, uh, and once uh, the Roman citizens began to be exploited by the taxes of the empire, typically during the third century after Christ and in the later, in the later centuries, there um, was established a deep divide between the state and the citizens. And this is, in my opinion, the birthplace of Italy. Uh, Italians don't like the state. They're, sometimes you say they are natural anarchists, although this is not the case anymore. But anyway, uh, lots of barbarians who invaded the Western Empire were saluted as um, liberators because they uh, brought with them very light states. Of course, they were warriors and, and conquerors, but they had not the organization of the Roman Empire, especially the fiscal organization of the Roman Empire, and they could not get so many taxes from the, from the, um, from the citizens. <clears throat> um, after the so-called Dark Ages and, the, and the, um, the period of the first 
uh, Middle Age, Italy um, ha experienced what uh, Peter Schwartz was referring to, um, um, an incredible flourishing of arts, of building, of wealth. Uh, banking was invented in, the, in, in, in Italy. Uh, the city-states uh, were very powerful, were very rich, and um, they could enjoy a situation where <clears throat> the um, political uh, cloud of the German emperors and of the popes was in place but was not so strong. Uh, Italians uh, uh, won very important battles against the, the German emperors. The most important one, which is always cited, is the Battle of Legnano against the Emperor Federico, Fred, Frederick Barbarossa. And the League of Northern Italian Cities defeated the Emperor. And um, the independence of city-states, the um, uh, different laws, different rules, is maybe one of the best examples of um, a spontaneous order of an anarchist society. Uh, not exactly what we would like as a, as a private law society, but it was pretty close. Uh, the <clears throat> situation of Italy and the wealth of the Italians attracted, of course, foreigners. And uh, starting from the uh, late 15th and early 16th century, Italy became um, territory of conquest for the Spanish, for the French, for, and later for the Austrians. Um, Italians didn't really care about this. There's a saying in Italy which is uh, Franza o Alemania purché se magna. This means France or Germany. The important thing is that we eat. And this is a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a very, very uh, good description of the Italian attitude. Italians don't care who the ruler is, and the ruler is someone who is very far away. He may be French, may be Spanish. That's, that makes no difference. The important thing is that their private life is a good life. And there was a famous um, uh, expert on Italian literature in the 19th century, Francesco De Santis, who uh, um, criticized this Italian attitude. In his opinion, there were two, um, two ideas of Italy. One represented by Machiavelli, so the idea of the ruthless ruler, war as the uh, system to build up states, and this was his ideal. Uh, we will speak of it later. The other one is another historian who is not so famous as Machiavelli, but in my opinion, who was the best uh, interpreter of the Italian attitude towards life and social life, who was Francesco Guicciardini. And in his uh, book, The Remembrances, it's a book of, of short pieces where he remembers his life as a diplomat. He was a high-ranking diplomat of the of Florence, and he said Italians look after their own business, we would say in English. In, Itali in Italian it's the particulare suo. Uh, we have also a very vulgar expression to say this, but anyway I won't mention it here. But uh, it, this is a, is, is a typical attitude of Italians, so I mind my own business. I, I don't care about the state, I don't care about the others, so there's a lack of, of solidarity, a lack of, of unity between Italians. But um, this is a very intelligent uh, description of, of Italians. Um, notwithstanding the fact that Italy had been conquered by foreign powers, the uh, flourishing in, in arts, in literature, in architecture continued. Every, everyone who has visited Italy has it before his eyes. We have wonderful churches, palaces, uh, works of art, even after the French stole them and brought them to Paris. We still have an amount of, of works of art which is incredible. And um, the idea of Italy as a concept began to be gathered around uh, a cultural unity. So the first ones during the 18th century, speaking of Italy as an idea, uh, were especially uh, writers. Uh, I can 
quote Alfieri, Vittorio Alfieri, he was a writer of, of tragedies for the theater, and the very famous Ugo Foscolo, who was a poet. And uh, the idea was that there was some kind of cultural unity of Italians. Of course, at that time, this was no more the, uh, than an illusion. Uh, the, the little elite who were in, 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 who had the capacity of reading Dante, Petrarca, and understand, even understanding Italian, they were just a few. Uh, the majority of the Italians spoke dialect, never read anything, and couldn't even conceive the idea of, of uh, Italy as a cultural unity. Anyway, uh, the idea became stronger and stronger, but the problem is um, the, uh, most of these uh, writers were um, deeply uh, connected with the classical culture. So uh, instead of uh, going to the, to the liberal tradition, which was starting in England, in the United States, so the idea of a minimal state, of, a, of freedom, of personal freedom, they <clears throat> went back to the classical writers who saw freedom, political freedom, as the freedom to be part of a political community. And so they tried, and they, the idea was to uh, bring back the idea of, of ancient Rome and of ancient Greek cities to Italy, which was, of course, completely impossible. And ancient writers always uh, celebrated war and violence as a way of establishing political power. This became particularly important with the Napoleonic conquests of Italy. Uh, Napoleon changed the political geography of Italy completely because he established <clears throat> um, different republics and, and independent states in Italy. And for the first time, Italians got the idea that they could be involved in politics and um, that they could build their own state. Uh, the, the Napoleon hadn't really an interest to build an independent Italian state. Uh, he wanted uh, satellite countries which would be buffer states around France. But anyway, his public proclamations, especially during the first time when he still was uh, consul and not, not emperor, were along these lines. And he stirred interest among Italians for this kind of new idea of politics. What is very interesting, uh, Napoleon uh, gave the beginning also to a, another, uh, let's say, political movement that was very important during the 19th century, which is the wars of resistance against Napoleonic invasions. Uh, in Italy, you had something similar or comparable to the resistance against Napoleon in Spain. Uh, although not as a national movement. But what is very important is, especially in the south of Italy, the king uh, recruited criminals to fight against, uh, against Napoleon. And this may be the uh, birth of the mafia in, and of the criminal organizations in southern Italy. Uh, since Napoleon wasn't um, able to keep in check the territory, and since the king has, had been ousted of his territories, the only way of establishing a kind of control on, on the territory and on the citizens were an alliance with uh, criminals, with the so-called banditi. And they were the ones who fought, even with great success, against the, the um, French soldiers. Um, very famous criminals were uh, promoted to generals of the army, and the very strict connection between state power and organized criminality began during these years. Um, during the beginning of the uh, 19th century, there were attempts at revolutions, attempts to build a unified state. Um, the main idea which came from two very prominent persons in the Italian unification, the, the so-called Risorgimento, the new birth of Italy, uh, namely Mazzini and Garibaldi, was to 
build a national character because they all knew that there, is, there was no national character of the Italians and especially they knew that Italians didn't have a big interest in, in uh, unified Italy, especially in the south. So the idea was to build Italy by means of a war of blood, of, uh, they say, that they always said, the baptism of fire and blood. This was the idea. So the idea was to build a warlike nation, although Italians never had been warlike and, and uh, very fond of war, and uh, to achieve unification of Italy during, by means of war. It's significant that Germans um, did the same uh, a few years after Italy because the, the, the idea was the same, to achieve unity through a war, in this case, against France. For the Italians, it was Austria. In fact, uh, unification of Italy was not an achievement of a warlike nation. Uh, Italian armies did not so well during the wars of unification. Who was the real maker of Italy was Camillo Cavour. Uh, it's interesting to note he had a French surname and his first language was French. Uh, he usually wrote French in his letters to, other, to the king and to other uh, politicians. Yet he had this idea of uh, Italy and how did he achieve Italian unification? Mainly by means of intrigues, secret services. Uh, he exploited very uh, mm, very ruthlessly um, the um, uh, sexual appetites of uh, the French Emperor Napoleon III and of the Italian king. He provided high-ranking prostitutes to get in the beds of these two monarchs. And uh, he bribed the army officers of the southern kingdom. Uh, he had a very ambiguous position as far as Garibaldi was concerned. You know, it, Italian unification was achieved by means of the expedition of the thousand, so-called. Uh, two boats left the port of Quarto in the near, near, near um, Genova, and they sailed to Sicily to invade Sicily and free southern Italy from the Bourbon kings, from King Francis. And um, when Garibaldi arrived, the more or less thousand uh, soldiers were joined by rebels. This is the official, official history. And a big rebellion in Sicily um, uh, ousted the king. Uh, then he passed over to the mainland Italy and uh, was joined by the, by the army of, of Piedmont, of the king of Sardinia and Piedmont and they achieved unification of Italy and uh, Garibaldi and the king were described as sort of, of brothers in, in this uh, venture of unifying Italy. In fact, it was also um, um, a thing of secret service, <coughs> of British financing to the whole enterprise, and most important, uh, Garibaldi could achieve this result only by an alliance with the local criminal organization, the Mafia. Otherwise, he couldn't have done it. It is very interesting that um, the, the ship where the whole accounting of the expedition of the thousand soldiers of Garibaldi, uh, the ship was called Ercole Hercules, and commanded by uh, a young Italian writer, Ippolito Nievo, who was only 30 years old, the uh, ship disappeared with all the documents. No corpses were found, uh, nothing was found at all of the ship, and this uh, made impossible to see how the money had been spent, who paid the money, because probably it came from, from Britain, who had an interest of building up uh, power against the French in the Mediterranean. And so the whole official narrative is very, very um, unlikely. Um, there is a very interesting book that not many know uh, of uh, uh, Filippo Curletti, who was um, a spy, a secret service agent for, um, for Cavour, who uh, described exactly what he did 
to bribe the people in, the, in southern Italy to um, bring about elections in favor of the unification of Italy, which were completely fake, like maybe in the United States now. They, they brought the people to the, to the, to the polls with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the election slides already with, yes, we want unification of Italy. They couldn't even read and so on. Anyway. Uh, Italy was more or less unified in 1861. Uh, during the next 10 years, we had a brutal civil war, which is always uh, not usually uh, described in, in mainstream history books. Uh, in southern Italy, we had a civil war of uh, former uh, militaries of the, of the southern army, together with uh, criminals, the so-called banditi. In fact, they were freedom fighters or fighters against an invasion from a foreign country because this was the unification of southern Italy. There were very famous banditi, Carmine Crocco, uh, Ninconanco. They were very romantic figures because they could held in check a very organized army like the Piedmontese army for 10 years, more or less. Um, they were defeated at the end, and uh, this gave rise to two movements which are very important in Italian modern history. On one side, the emigration. There were lots of southern Italians who felt that they didn't have a fatherland anymore, they did not identify with Italy, and they left Italy. Millions of Italians uh, sailed to the United States, to Argentina, to South America, to Brazil, and we still have so many Italians in the whole world, and this comes from that time, and it continued for more or less 100 years. Another very important movement that came out of the War of Conquest is uh, Italian anarchism. Italian anarchism is one of the most um, strong anarchist movement, was one of the most strong anarchist movements in the, in the 19th century. And for a certain time, it was uh, really a danger for the newborn Italian state. Um, both uh, Prime Minister Crispi, who was a very important uh, Prime Minister during, at the end of the 19th century, and Giolitti, fought against the anarchists with special laws, with uh, ruthless police interventions, but the anarchists weren't uh, peaceful people, at, uh, this must be said. There have been lots of um, kings and, and queens killed by the anarchists. The most uh, important episode of the anarchist fight against the Italian government is that of Gaetano Bresci. Uh, in 1898, a new tax was passed on, on, um, on, on bread and flour, and this uh, made for many Italians the, the um, uh, bread really expensive. So it meant hunger, starvation for lots of Italians. And in Milano, uh, there, was, there were big protests in the city with barricades and people protesting against this tax. And uh, King Umberto I ordered one of his generals, uh, Bava Beccaris, to uh, finish the rebellion ruthlessly and with violence. And uh, Bava Beccaris shot the, the crowd with cannons and killed officially 90 persons, uh, probably around 300, 400. It was a great tragedy. And uh, not happy of that, the king awarded the general with a, with a medal for his brave and outstanding results during the rebellion in Milano. Um, and this uh, stirred the reactions of the anarchists, especially of one Gaetano Bresci. Uh, he was one of the many Italians who um, went to the United States to escape the, the Italian uh, state. Uh, he was living in the same city where later very famous anarchists um, Sacco and Vanzetti were living. It was a sort of uh, anarchist enclosure in the United States. He went back to Italy 
uh, with the idea to shoot the king. And in fact, um, in, uh, on July 1900, he shot the king in Monza, uh, and Umberto I died uh, of this. Berisci was very successfully defended by a great anarchist lawyer whom I admire very much, Francesco Saverio Merlino, <clears throat> and uh, he was incredibly condemned to life and not to, to, to lifelong sentence and not uh, hanged, what, what would have been the, the natural thing. Of course, he was killed in, in jail a few, a few years after, but anyway. Um, anarchists were a strong force at the beginning of the 20th century in Italy. And um, the polarization of uh, Italian politics at the beginning of the 19th century were along two lines. On one side, anarchists and socialists, at that time they were still allied, uh, although there had been a big divide between anarchists and socialists because Anarchists didn't believe in the state, and socialists, of course, believed in the state as a means of acquiring the um, control of, of the means of production. Uh, on the other side, nationalists, and, of course, uh, Catholics, who were a little bit outside the, the Italian politics because they, uh, the conquest of Rome by the Italian state in 1870 created a big divide between the Pope and the Italian state. But yet there was a, let's say, a bourgeois alliance of liberals, of um, a little, some Catholics um, who called the shots in Italy. On the other side were the revolutionaries, the anarchists, the socialists, and so on. In this uh, political situation, there arose a very important political movement, which is not often mentioned, and which is uh, really the birthplace of fascism, which is nationalism. Uh, you can cite as um, very important persons of nationalism, Gabriele D'Annunzio, the poet, the Futurists, so Marinetti, the movement of the Futurism, um, and they wanted to establish the same thing that was the ideal of the Risorgimento. They wanted to establish a strong country with a strong army and possibly to achieve military victories. Um, in 1915, this movement was the movement behind the interventionism of Italy in World War I. Uh, Italy uh, had an alliance with Germany and Austria, and according to the treaty, Italy was entitled to remain neutral during World War I, which was the idea of Giolitti. He was a liberal prime minister. He was well aware that Italy hadn't the uh, possibility to join the war, and he wanted to keep Italy out, out of the war. It would have been a very intelligent course of action, but uh, the nationalists weren't of that idea. They began a very hard and strong campaign in favor of the intervention of Italy in World War I. Uh, they were joined by Mussolini, at that time still a socialist, and um, the Giolitti uh, government fell. He was substituted by another uh, politician, Antonio Salandra, who um, made a secret treaty with, uh, with Great Britain and France in order to get Italy into, uh, into World War I. And he presented the treaty as a fait accompli to the parliament and to the, to the king. Um, the majority of uh, the members of parliament uh, went to Giolitti and pledged their um, assistance to him in order to reverse the treaty. But Giolitti was afraid of, of um, um, not holding the promises to, to Great Britain and France. And this is how Italy uh, entered World War I. Um, World War I was aptly called by Pope Benedict XV as the suicide of Europe and the useless massacre. Uh, he was very against uh, World War I. Uh, when Italy entered World War I, he uh, called it not a war, but a big war, il guerrone, 
an enormous war. And, okay, he was right. Um, starting with World War I, as in many countries, Italy changed completely. We had um, command economy, government spending, and uh, the whole of the economy was, um, was used for the interests of the state. So the beginning of big state in Italy is the beginning of, uh, is uh, connected with World War I. So since that time, uh, in my opinion, fascism was born. The idea, uh, there is a very um, uh, important phrase by Mussolini. He said, everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. And this attitude began during World War I. In fact, um, Mussolini came to power in 1922 with the March on Rome, but the origins of what was later to become fascism uh, can be searched in World War I. Um, World War I was for the Italian uh, brutal war. Uh, conscripts uh, from, all, uh, from all of Italy, most of them um, ignorant, peasants who didn't understand anything, not even the officers commanding them because they spoke a dialect and they didn't understand the officers, were forced to uh, assault against uh, Austrian machine guns and just die. <clears throat> Italian, the Italian front was organized on two lines. On the first line, there were the soldiers who were supposed to attack against the Austrians. Behind them, there were the carabinieri or the Guardia di Finanza, the, the tax police, who had their own machine guns, and so the choice was to go to the Austrian machine guns, or if, if someone retreated, to be shot by the Carabinieri and the Guardia di Finanza. So this was the <coughs> World War I. Uh, the, on the front, there was ruthless discipline with um, summary shootings of soldiers on, uh, by officers, with um, decimations, which uh, I think the only army who, who did this was the Italian army. If um, um, uh, a part of the army wasn't um, obedient to the orders, uh, and if it was impossible to establish who was the responsible for disobedience, uh, the uh, commanders ordered uh, one in 10 soldiers to be shot. Um, there is a very interesting book by a writer whose uh, name is uh, Emilio Lussu, uh, Un anno sull'altipiano, a year on the, on, the, um, on the high mountains, and he describes this atmosphere, and there is also a very interesting movie about, about this, um, uh, from this book uh, by Francesco Rosi. The, the movie was prohibited in the 70s, as an um, um, offense to the armed forces, still. So, <laughs> this is Italy. Uh, I'll try to be fast. After World War I, as everyone knows, uh, fascism was established. Um, as Umberto Eco said, uh, fascism is eternal. It never went away. Uh, Italians were enthusiastic about Mussolini, about fascism. Um, they uh, liked the idea of having a big nanny state which would uh, provide for the Italians from the cradle to the tomb. And uh, if it had not been for the errors of Mussolini of entering the war uh, at a timing when, when Italy wasn't capable of, of, of uh, sustaining the war, we would still be fascists in Italy, I think. Or maybe we would have abandoned fascism as the Spanish uh, Frankism in the 70s or something like that. Um, the, um, Italy was liberated by the Americans and not by the resistance fighters, as the common legend goes. And uh, the most important thing to say is that after fascism, um, as 
in part in Germany, but more so than that, the um, high-ranking bureaucrats and the uh, fascist system was not abandoned. So we had a constitution in 1948, and the constitution provides for certain um, fundamental rights, but the main architecture of the fascist state remained in place, and in part still is in place. Uh, one of the interesting things which give you an impression of how it went in Italy after the war is that the uh, president of the racial commission in Italy, who was a, a lawyer, Gaetano Azzariti, it was the commission who had, could decide if someone belonged to the Jewish race and then had, thus, thus had to be deported or not. Um, he became the first president of the Italian Constitutional Court. So <laughs> this gives you <laughs> a good impression of what Italy is. Uh, we did have in the 50s and the 60s this short retreat of the state. Uh, you can see it from the, from the public debt. Uh, in, in the 1960s, public debt was around 20-30% of GDP. Um, in 1970, it soared to 40%. In 1990, we came close to 100%. Now we are uh, to 155% of uh, GDP. So the presence of the state, which was a little bit lighter during the 50s and the 60s, um, retreated uh, and, and then came back. We had a big comeback of the state during the years of terrorism and later so during the years where, when Italy joined the, the Euro and became part um, of, of, um, of the monetary union. And during the last years, the very last years, we had a big, big comeback of, of the state. Um, the fiscal oppression in Italy is crazy. Um, Milton Friedman famously said when he, they asked him what is the, the biggest uh, economic resource of Italy, he said it's tax evasion. And in fact, <laughs> it still is like this, but it's going back. So the, thanks to technology, the fiscal authorities are becoming more and more efficient, and so they are just extortioning around uh, 65, 70 percent of the, of the national revenue. This can't go on. Uh, in fact, we witnessed um, the end of democracy, more or less, since the government of Mario Monti uh, elections have no importance whatsoever as far as the prime ministers are concerned. And during the COVID crisis, and here I end, um, the oppression of the state became unbearable. Uh, I leave you with a glimmer of hope uh, in this very uh, sad description of Italy. Uh, a big protest movement is uh, building up in Italy. Um, I myself are, are, am one of the, of the uh, they call, police called me the leader of the rebellion. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm fighting the government and um, the interest for anti-state movements is coming back. I have um, funny conversations with uh, state employees who ask me about Rothbard and Frank Chodorov and what they can read about <clears throat> about the idea of getting rid of the state. I um, recommended them to read uh, Hans's books. So uh, something is changing. Maybe we can achieve it. Uh, maybe we can, we can achieve at least to go back a little bit more in the direction of a minimal state. Maybe we can achieve to uh, give force to secessionist movements like in Sardinia and in Veneto. If not, we will be in a statist nightmare, which was the dream of the fascists, and which will be, unluckily, the end of my country. I thank you very much for your attention.